All right. Let's go ahead and get started this morning. Uh, take your Bible and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. Um, just for those of you that are curious, I know you got there, or some of you got the email yesterday. Um, she is here today. This thing's a little bit like riding a roller coaster. It's up and down and sometimes changes daily and sometimes hourly, but um, as of right now, she's going to keep going and doing what all she can do um, as much as she can, and um, she's doing pretty good today so far. So um, I'll give you a little bit more. I hate to be redundant and tell you something now and then turn around and tell you something in the regular service when more folks are here, but rather than say it 50 different times, I'll just save it for uh, the morning service and just give you a little bit of an update. But uh, suffice it to say, she'll be starting treatments right away, and we'll see what the Lord does with all of that. All right, now we're talking about the fear of the Lord and, and uh, the importance of the fear of the Lord. It is important to understand it, but let me, let me make this uh, evident to you, maybe uh, clear to you. Maybe a, a good way to put that is, is to help you to understand the importance of defining what it is we're talking about. If you don't have the proper definitions, then you're going to go with what your definition is. And then the problem with that is that if my definition is different than your definition, then we're going to wind up talking about two different things in the same conversation. So it's imperative that when we come to that, that you have a central or a focal point of authority. It's the same way, in a sense, when you're counseling two people that have a disagreement, whether it be marital counseling or whether it be uh, two friends that have gotten into a squabble or whatever it might be. If you can't establish an authority that both parties recognize as an authority, then you're headed for trouble because the conflict will continue and both parties will believe 100% that they are 100% correct. Now, probably with the exception of Miss Elaine, she's been in court many, many times over the years, but we have a number of attorneys that are here, but she's probably the most prolific at being in, in court on a regular basis. Uh, the, the thing you have to understand is, is that both sides, both the opposition and the, the prosecution, they both have to surrender what they think to what precedent is set according to the law, whether it's state or federal or local law. So that winds up determining the definition of how they can try their case. Does that make sense to you? Otherwise, you wind up with nothing but opposing opinions. And when you wind up with just opposing opinions, you can't resolve anything that way. Here's a little bit of help for you when it comes to uh, marriage. Uh, if you learn to let the Bible be the authority and not how you feel, you'll go a longer way at resolving some of the continual conflicts than if you just keep on holding on to your emotions or how you were raised or we don't do it like that around here kind of a thing. So it's important when you study this thing about the fear of the Lord to understand that the Bible has to become the central authority. Our opinion doesn't matter. Amen. It's what does God say? Look in 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. You say, well, preacher, who doesn't know that? Yeah, but if you don't establish that then your idea of what the fear of the Lord is is going to be skewed from what the Bible says the fear of the Lord is. It doesn't matter what I think it is. Let's see what the Bible says it is. And you might be surprised. You might, as you go through this study and we start pulling these verses, you know what you might find out? You might find out that your opinion of what the fear of the Lord is isn't correct at all. All right, notice 1 Corinthians 14. Just come all the way down to verse number 13, uh, 37. If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge that the things that I write unto you are the commandments of the Lord. All right. So the most important thing, Proverbs chapter number eight, is for us to understand that the commandments that are coming, they're coming from the Lord. That's why we keep going. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. Now, do you understand that, if, that the problem ultimately is one of authority? Do you understand that when an individual wants to argue over things, they don't want to go to the Bible because they don't recognize the Bible as an authority? Uh, if you've ever been a couple and you want to come in and sit down and talk with me, the first thing I'm going to say is, is do you believe the Bible? Do you believe the Bible? If they believe the Bible, then the argument is over. But believing it is one thing. Submitting to it is entirely different. I can believe what it says. 
But if I don't subject myself to it, then it doesn't do any benefit to him. Remember in 1 Thessalonians chapter number 2, he said, When we came unto you, you received our words, not as it were, in fact, the words of men, but it was indeed the words of God that effectually worketh in you that what? So it has no effect if you don't believe it. And belief means you exercise it. That means that you act upon what you say that you believe. Many people believe Jesus Christ was here. They actually believe that He walked the face of the earth, that He was crucified, and some of them even believe the resurrection. But they don't believe it was for their sins. They just, they just think, well, I believe that. Yeah, but it doesn't effectually work into you until you believe that it's for you. So these, these passages apply. All right, now take your Bible, look in Proverbs chapter number 8. We're going to get a definition here. Look in verse number uh, 13. The fear of the Lord is, so it would be a definition, to hate evil. Notice the colon that's there. So you can insert the word hate pride, hate arrogancy, hate the evil way, hate the froward mouth. Do I hate? Do you see that? So what he says there is, the fear of the Lord is, the demonstration of that is, is to hate the things that God hates. That's a different, a different idea. You say, what is that? That's the fear of the Lord in action. You say, why? God's saying, I'm seeing whether or not you fear me by how you treat evil things, how you treat pride, how you treat arrogancy, how you treat the evil way, how you treat the forward mouth. This is smart alecky stuff. Look at uh, the, the prideful way, the arrogancy. Look in Proverbs 6, cross the page in my Bible. Six things, are, verse number 16. These six things that the Lord hate. Isn't that what we're looking for? You say, well, preacher, that's hate speech. That's hate speech. It is hate speech. But you see, you've gotten a skewed opinion of hate speech, ladies and gentlemen, based upon news media. Listen, you don't fact check news media. About 85% of what's in your newspaper and on your reports and in the stuff, that's by reporters just telling you what somebody else said. It's not a court case and it's not even in most cases even validated. You couldn't carry it in and use it to represent anything. It's just simply to spin you up and to quote, report the news. But about 85% of it's not even true. You say, what does it do? It sells newspapers. It sells subscriptions. It sells uh, 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 medications and different things. After they get you reading all that kind of stuff, you get to thinking everybody in the whole world's crazy and everybody needs to be on something because if you're not, you're going to run off the deep end. That's called marketing. What are they using? They're using fear. Well, I would even I'll be honest with you. If you could learn to fear the world, I mean, fear the Lord as much as you fear the world and what it can do to you, you'd probably be doing better right now than you're currently doing. Amen. The fear of the Lord is to hate evil. Well, do you hate evil? Amen. Well, I can't really hate evil because that... Okay, wait a minute now. If you hate evil, then that means you have to hate the ones that do the evil. Do you hate pride? I'm not talking about in other people's lives. I'm talking about in your own life. In my life. Do you hate pride? The Lord said, if you fear me, you'll hate it. Pride goeth before a fall and a haughty spirit before destruction. Six things doth the Lord hate. Verse 16, yea, seventh are an abomination to him. I mean, he's carrying it a pretty good distance, isn't he? <laughs> Notice what he says, a proud look. The Lord hates it. He says it's an abomination. That's walking around with your nose up so high you drowned if it rained. Proud of your accomplishments. Proud of, of who you are. Proud as a peacock strutting around with all your tail feathers showing. Gay pride. Be proud of, of being different. Be proud of being a, a furry. That's, that's the new thing now. The furry, you can call your claim yourself to be an animal now and give you a litter box in the in the restroom. Oh, do some homework. I'm not stretching it. Your scholastic system has gone down the, the drain. Your kid can walk in and say, I, I'm a cat. What? I, I need a litter box. You better provide a litter box. We'll provide a box for you, but it won't be for... We're going to take out the trash, but... But you see, you, you're, you get the, the idea because of the media, you've gotten accustomed to it now. It doesn't appall you like it used to. 
All right, now notice, what's, look what's listed here with pride. He says, a, a proud look, a lying tongue. He that sheddeth innocent blood. Well, now, I'm preacher, I never killed anybody. How many have you slain with your tongue or with a pen? Or a keyboard? Are you sure you haven't murdered somebody's reputation? Are you sure you got all your facts together before you started making accusations? Or are you sure you didn't just jump on something because you didn't care for somebody and you got a good opportunity to get some good juicy gossip and, gossip and throw it out there before you, before you checked? I'm just giving you something in the passage here. A heart that deviseth wicked imaginations. Feet that are uh, swift to run to mischief, a false witness that speaketh lies, and he that soweth discord among the brethren. Now what he tells you there, come over if you will to Acts chapter number 9. He said there's some things and when it comes to fear in the Lord that we have to do. And you have to get back to that. If you want success in the Christian life, you're going to have to run contrary to mainstream media. I'm sorry to tell you that. I don't preach to you stuff out of the headlines. Headlines are like sleeping on a corduroy pillow. If you sleep on a corduroy pillow, you'll wake up with headlines. <laughs> Thank you for the pity laugh. I appreciate that. <laughs> you say, why? How can I preach to you out of the headlines when the source for the headlines is not a pure source? I can't help you spiritually preaching to you out of the headlines. Lord knows, man, that stuff's like trying to nail jello to the wall. It's whatever the flavor of the day is. It doesn't make any difference, uh, all the stuff that goes on. And then the next thing you know, whatever else has taken over the headlines, it changes all the time. I can stick with that right there and I don't have to worry about it. Do you see, we started off talking about the proper definition, the proper authority. All right, look, if you will, in Acts chapter number 9. We're just trying to establish what the fear of the Lord is. Verse number 31. I'm going to say that when I read that stuff the, in the, in the uh, passage there, about what the fear of the Lord is as far as a definition is concerned. I'm going to say that I probably don't think, I, I don't think I had the proper fear of the Lord if I put myself in that definition. To hate evil and to hate pride and all the things that are there. Do I hate it? Do you hate it enough to stop it? I didn't say you, I said me. If I hate it, that means I don't have anything to do with it. How many of you say you hate it, but you keep doing it? Well, then with all due respect, you're a liar. You don't hate it bad enough to quit it. I hate what this is doing to me. I hate what this is doing to me. I hate, then stop it. But then what happens is you wind up going about it in a different way and you wind up uh, uh, petting that snake until eventually it'll wind up strangling you. Acts chapter number nine, verse 31. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in comfort of the Holy Ghost and were multiplied. Uh, once Paul was gone and everything is over and said and done there, the Apostle Paul comes through there and one of the telltale signs that he had been there is, is that he firmly established the church to fear God. And guess what it brought? The fear of the Lord brings peace. All right, let's go a little further. Come to 2 Corinthians chapter number 7. Do you walk a circumspect life? Circumspect, that's a, a kind of a fancy word. Circumference is the root word of that, that it comes from. Circumspect, do you, do you walk, do you consider your every uh, um, uh, um, possibility in your life? Do you walk circumspectly, keeping an eye on what you're doing in the circle? 2 Corinthians chapter 7, most of you are familiar with this. Having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness. But look at that last part of the verse. Why should I do that? Because I fear God. Preacher, that's not a good motive. Well, then the Bible's a liar. The Bible said I should have a circumspect life. That means I should be looking at myself, what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And I should be doing that to keep my life clean. Why? Because I fear God. That's the biblical term. I hate it when I'm not in fellowship with God. I hate it when I'm not walking with Him. I hate it when I'm not talking with Him. I hate it when I've been displeasing to Him. I hate it when I sin against Him. I hate it when I sin against the brethren. I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. Nowadays that word's being taken out of your English language. But it's a strong word, preacher. Yeah, it's a strong word. 
Job chapter number 28. It's intended to be a strong word. Job's the oldest book written in your Bible. Job chapter 28. It's not listed as Genesis because that's the Pentateuch that's there. But the oldest Bible, uh, book in your Bible is the book of Job. And if anybody has some wisdom on life, he's got some wisdom on life. And Job's going to give you some uh, information. And I don't know anybody in here that wouldn't like to be smarter than you currently are. I mean, I, I really, I don't know anybody in here that is at there. You know what I like about intellectual individuals? They always have a starvation to get more intellectual. You say that's pride. I say it's lazy on your part. Why are you always trying to knock them off a rung on the ladder? I appreciate people that study and want to get better. Well, they're just a brainiac. Well, you're just a lazy. You did good to get out of the first grade. That's a, that's a cheap shot. Why would you, why would you do that? Amen, preacher. That's good preaching. But you ever, you ever consider that? Do you want to get some wisdom? Don't raise your hand. I bet you you've prayed this prayer before. I bet you you've prayed, uh, Lord, make me wise like you made Solomon wise. But your motive for praying that is, is that the Lord will wind up granting you all the material possessions. Y'all are being careful not to laugh. Do you really want wisdom? There's a hook in it. Do you really want wisdom? You want wisdom to raise your kids? You want wisdom to know how to do things at work? You want wisdom to know what you need to do as far as life is concerned, your marriage is concerned, or whatever it might be? Well, guess where it's found? It's found in one of the, Bible, one of the books in the Bible. The Bible's full of wisdom. Job chapter number 28, and verse number 28. And unto the man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. You're smarter than you think. You say, why? I'm afraid of God. And to depart from evil is, you know what he says? To fear and to begin with is wisdom. But now how am I going to apply that? Applying that is what is called understanding. Meaning if I just fear him, but I don't quit doing it, then I don't understand the real fear of the Lord. But if I fear him, that's wisdom. Now I got the wisdom. How do I apply that practically? I depart from evil. I gave you the passage in Proverbs. It's to hate evil. So you can't say that you fear the Lord, but you keep doing evil. I told you when we started this a while back and when I mentioned it in Bible study before I got all the other stuff that went on, I told you that the answer to man's problem is for a Christian is that we need to get back to just good old fashioned fear in God. This nation doesn't fear God. But you know what's worse than that? Christians no longer fear God. You don't even think twice about doing things that you know are not right. So everybody else does it. That's not an excuse. What does God say about it? Well, but preacher, you know, times have changed. But He hasn't changed. But you see, that, that what that is, is, is you're kind of playing that fear down. That fear is, is like, man, I, I'm, I, I don't want to do that. You say, why? Not because I'm afraid of what God's going to do to me, but because it's wisdom. And then understanding is to put it into action. Why? I'm trusting God that it's the right thing to do. Well, why don't you do it? Because you're smarter than God. That's why you thumb your nose at God and you just do what you want to do. You don't care who it hurts. You don't care. You've made your mind up. I'm going to do what I want to do. Okay. That means, number one, you have no wisdom. You're ignorant. And that means, number two, you have no understanding. Or not. <laughs> Psalms 111. Now we're talking about gathering some wisdom here. Uh, I don't know about you. Right now I feel like I'm uh, an imbecile. And uh, you say, why? We're going through things I don't know anything about. I'm doing my best to equip myself with massive amounts of information. You say, why? I've got somebody in a jam and it's outside of my purview. And before I just throw all my eggs in a basket, I'm going to do all I can to make the best decision I can make. But I have to equip myself by spending a little bit of time, get my nose and eyes off the box and get it in a book somewhere and say, Lord, I need, I need some wisdom here. What do we do? How do we handle this? What decision do we make? You know, there's a fine line, ladies and gentlemen, between faith and stupidity. You get people, you know, don't do this and don't do that. And if I was you, I'd do this and I'd do that. Hey, you're not the one faced with what we're facing right now. 
You say, what are you trying to do? That's not what I need. I don't need somebody to tell me what to do. I need to learn about what the situation is. But I realize this in studying the, the, the information here that part of the problem is, is that I haven't learned anything and I can't learn anything until I learn to fear God. The secret of the Lord is with them that fear Him. If I want that inside information, if I want to get that what's really going on and what do I need to do, it begins, and you can you believe this? It begins with me knowing how to fear God. God said that's the key that unlocks the treasure chest. You want me to give you something supernatural? Do you tremble at my word? Tremble at my word. The Lord is with them that tremble at His, at His word. Do you tremble at it when you read it? I don't know if you do or not. I know sometimes I read it so much it becomes sort of commonplace. I forget that's God's words on that page. It gives me a, more than a reverential trust. It's like, that's a pretty big God, man. <laughs> he fills heaven and earth. You got galaxies that are out there that are a hundred times bigger than the galaxy that you're in. The Hubble telescope sent all that stuff back. And you start looking at that kind of deal and you realize if God fills heaven and earth and God is that large and He wears the universe as a garment, you got a mighty big God. Yeah. And to not tremble at that is, it's, 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 just, it's ludicrous. Yeah. Psalms 111, look in verse number 10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. Where's the, where is the beginning of wisdom? Fear in the Lord. So I can't even claim to get any wisdom until I learn to fear Him the way I'm supposed to fear Him. You say, well, I fear Him. Well, let's just see. Look in Proverbs chapter 15. Proverbs chapter 15, next book over. You fear the Lord to realize that uh, the Lord can take care of you when money can't? Amen. When your friends and family and doctor can't? Amen. I mean, He can have supernatural intervention, can He? Amen. Proverbs chapter number 15. Uh, look in verse number 16. Better is little with the fear of the Lord than great treasure and trouble therewith. It's better that you don't have anything but you've got the fear of God. You say, why? He can get you out when money can't. Amen. Amen. Come over, if you will, please, uh, along that same line. Look in uh, Isaiah 33. Preacher, I'm so afraid, I'm, I, I'm, I'm afraid of the Lord, so I want to run from Him. The fear I'm talking about, and I'll show you this in a little while, uh, is the kind of fear that you're afraid to run away from Him. You don't want to get away from Him. It's not like I'm, I'm afraid of Him and it makes me run. I'm afraid to get too far from Him. Because in Him is all my strength and all my needs and all my concern, everything. That's the fear. I'm afraid to get too far from Him. Not I'm afraid of what he's going to do to me if I do it. That's their own kind of fear. The fear you're talking about is, is I'm afraid to leave him. Yes. I like the promise he gave me. You know, when the Lord saved you, he did an unusual thing. He was looking for a way to be able to get inside you without getting defiled. In the Old Testament, what you have is a situation there where the Holy Spirit can come into a man or come into a woman there and do great things, but the second that man or woman defiles their flesh, it defiles the soul, and therefore the Holy Spirit has to depart. In Psalm 51, David prays and he says, Lord, I pray you take not thy Holy Spirit from me. He knew because he committed murder and adultery that it's possible for the Lord to leave him. So what the Lord did for you on Calvary's cross, this is the reason for the cross is, is that from nose to toes, from the tip of your head until the tip of your toes down here, the Lord came in when you got saved in Colossians 2 and he did a laser operation and he fixed that thing where he is inside you without being defiled by you. Amen. You're sealed. Why? Well, just for your security? No, so He can stay with you, never leave you, never forsake you, no matter what you do. He's inside. God fixed that thing so that He could save you without being defiled by you. Otherwise, you know what happened? You'd be in and out like laundry. 
you wear it just a little while and it doesn't take long, especially the heat that's going to be coming up here before long. You walk outside, you walk down to the mailbox, you come back in the house and man, what's that smell? B.O., you stink already. Well, I just had a shower. Yeah, but it's 100% humidity outside and it's already 90 degrees at 8 o'clock in the morning and you sweat and you stink. You see what happens? You take your clothes off. You can't put on enough cologne to cover it up. What do you do? You throw them in the washing machine. Well, in the Old Testament, they had to keep washing. In the New Testament, you're washed. You're clean. You don't have to worry about that. You can't defile him. He fixed it where by Calvary's cross, he cut your soul away from your body. I didn't say you won't pay the price and there's retribution for doing things in your flesh, but it doesn't affect your soul. And if you could get a hold of that, God went to all that trouble just so he could remain with you. Can you imagine that? As wicked as you and I are. Let's, I mean, let, look, you're not as wicked as the queers, okay? But to God, you're all, not, you and I are wicked. As the day is long. We're wicked enough for every one of us to go to hell. Is that right? You know what God did? He fixed it the day you got saved. He sealed you that your wickedness doesn't separate you from him and you and him. That's a pretty good God. You know what he's doing? Tell me this, the stuff I'm giving you right now. Can you tell me where you'd be hurt by fear in God? Where, where would you be hurt by doing what God says? You got a problem with authority, you're going to, have, you're going to get hurt. There's nothing I'm giving you that would do you any harm. They could stand me up in a court of law or put me in jail and say it's abuse and it's use of, uh, abuse of authority and so on and so forth. You can't be teaching people to be afraid of God. That's wrong to do. Okay, well I don't believe it is according to the Bible. We'll see in the eternal judgment. You know what that terror of the Lord comes in? You know why individuals mess up in Galatians chapter number 5 and they do all those things in the flesh and over there in 1 Corinthians chapter number 6 and over there uh, in uh, 1 Corinthians 3 and in 2 Corinthians 5. You know why they do that? After they get saved, you lose your fear of God. You're not, you're not even thinking about it. And Paul said, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord. Yeah. You lost something. You know why you acted the way you acted there and all the things that are listed in Galatians 5? You lost your fear. The fear of the Lord. If you thought you were going to get caught, you wouldn't do it. But it's hard to stop that mouth from running, isn't it? You're not afraid. You're going to get your two cents worth in. And the Lord said, you better watch it. You better watch it. You better watch it. And then after a couple of times there, he's like, okay. You cook your own goose. He doesn't have to cook you. <laughs> you know the worst thing in the world you've ever seen is a man where God has just backed out of his life. Literally just said, okay. <laughs> no, Jesus, take the wheel. You got it. You drive it. He doesn't have to cause anything to happen to prove his authority. He'll leave you to your own destruction. And you will destruct. The second you lose that fear of God, you are on a highway to hell itself. Even if you're saved, you're not going to go to hell. But you know what will happen? Every Christian in here has the potential to live a life as if you're unsaved. Yes. Amen. And the reason you live a life as if you're unsaved, you lost the fear of God. Look in Isaiah chapter number 33. I'm not getting on to you. I'm trying to help you to, to see these things. I haven't emphasized it enough. I'm under conviction about it. Uh, I've been a little too easy on you. This has to do with the second coming of Christ here and all that. But look in verse number 6. And wisdom and knowledge shall be the stability of thy times and strength of salvation. The fear of the Lord is his treasure. Wow. Not, not my treasure. It's his treasure. Well, then I ought to be interested in his treasure. I think. Um, come to Galatians 6. You're familiar with this. Let me just show you this. Galatians chapter number 6. We're still defining. We're just getting started. It's all through your Bible. It's a, it's, it's a strange thing. It almost gets, it, it's almost as if the devil doesn't want you to see the promises that are here. So many people are interested in trying to be like um, 
uh, like the Charismatics, and they're trying to become spiritual uh, adoptees into the Jewish uh, stuff and pick up all the Jewish things in the Old Testament and do all this Jewish stuff and all that. They don't have the promises you have. Why would you do that? If you can claim to rightly divide your Bible, why would you be going in there and trying to take care of Jewish feasts and do us Jewish things and, and wear the phylacteries and wear all the, the things on your arms? and do? Why would you do that stuff? If my people that are called by my name will humble themselves and repent and turn from their wicked ways and I'll bless their nation and so on and so forth and this and that and the other, well, you're not his people. You're his bride. Why would you, why would you want to go back under the law? That's what Paul says. All, do you read your Bible? Old foolish Galatians? How is it you began in the Spirit and now you're back under the law? Right. Right. If Paul knew cat hair, he'd have said, what in the cat hair are you doing? <laughs> Why would you put yourself back under that bondage? And then he writes the book of Colossians and he says, you better watch all that stuff, esteeming a day better than another day and doing this and doing that and the worshiping of angels and the keeping yourself under and the will worship and all that. He warns you all through Colossians, but especially in Colossians 1 toward the end of that thing. He said, why are you doing that? You're free from that. Amen. There's something about, I don't, you know, well, what, what are you, Jewish? I'm not Jewish. Listen, in 1 Corinthians 6, when he gives the things there, he talks about people, personal that's there. You can't be those things. He says at the end of that stuff, effeminate adulterers and fornicators and all the things that are listed in that passage, you know what he said? And such were some of you. What are you now? You're saved now. You can't be those things anymore. You say, well, you can be a Christian, you can lie. Yeah, but you can't be a liar. You can be a Christian that lies, but you're not a liar anymore. Otherwise, the Bible says in Revelation, all liars will find their place in the, in the lake of fire. Right. Well, then we're all in trouble. Right. Come on, ladies. Last time you stepped on that scale. I just don't, I have no idea why that thing says what it does. I did, you know, let me... Pardon me. <laughs> Listen, it'd be better for you to just take one toe and kind of slide it back here and lift up on the scale while the other one's leaning here. <laughs> you get what it is you're looking for. I can't be a, a liar anymore. I can be a Christian that lies. Ladies and gentlemen, that stuff's in the Bible. You know why that stuff's in the Bible? You're free from all of that. Amen. God set up a new plan for you. You've been sealed to the day of redemption. Why would you put yourself back under that? You say, what is that? That's rigid, ritualistic. That's, I got to do it. What's the matter? You don't trust yourself? I've said to you before, and I don't mean I want her to make an exit anytime soon, but I've said to her before, I don't want you here because of, of a command or because we signed a document or because we made a promise 44 years ago to stay together. If you don't love me, get out or I'll get out. I don't want you coming home out of obligation. Can you imagine a Christian? Well, I'm obligated to do this. Well, I have to do this. No, you don't. No, you don't. You're saved. You don't have to do anything. Don't do anything. Do what you, you're still going to heaven. You're going to regret it when you get to the judgment seat, but why would you put yourself back under that? Except to maybe lift yourself up and now you're in Proverbs 6. You're exalting yourself. You're proud because you're doing something no one else is doing. I don't want to be a Jew. You say, why? I can't keep the law. All 600 and something. I'm not talking 10 commandments. I'm talking over 600 of them suckers, man. I can't do that. I don't even do good with the 10. Thou shalt not covet. Love the Lord thy God with all thy heart and all thy soul and all thy strength. This is the first commandment. <laughs> man, I can't get to the other nine for can't get by that one. I love myself more than him on more than one occasion. I'm glad I'm sealed. I don't know about you. You say, why? I, I got news for you. I can't make it. I'm not interested in just how tight I can tie my tie and how polished can I have my shoes. Some of the best meetings I've ever been in have been without a tie and even without shoes on. 
You say, what is that? All that stuff is, is just to kind of, it, it, it alienates you. It makes you look weird. You don't have to be a fruitcake. You just follow the Lord. You'll be fruitcake enough. You're going to raise your kids. They're going to be, they can't wait to get away from you. You say, what? You're a nut. I don't even know where I'm at. Oh, Galatians 6. I know where I'm at. I'm 38, 57. 38. Uh, Galatians 6. There it is. Verse number, uh, pick it up in verse 7. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. For whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. For he that soweth to his flesh, shall the flesh reap corruption. But he that soweth to the Spirit, shall reap life everlasting. Now, shall of the Spirit leap right, reap life everlasting. Uh, let me ask you a question. Do you ever realize that the Lord Proverbs chapter number 14 made you a promise? Do you think God's a liar? Have you ever put him to the test? Have you ever put him to the test just to see if he'll take care of you? I'm not talking about go out here and jump off a building. Proverbs chapter 14. That's stupidity. That's not faith. That's ignorance. There were some kids a lot of years ago and things like that. I don't know why this comes to my mind at certain times. But the train used to come across over there off of uh, oh, Edgewood, Beaver, way back out off that way. I don't even know if it still runs out there anymore. And uh, these kids got out there and they were doing a thing called jumping trains. And what they would do is, is see who could, who could go and get to the other side closer when the train was coming this way. You know, they'd run across the track, this and that and the other and all, because the train can't slow down, right? And they're jumping the tracks. Well, this one decides to wait to the last possible second. And then he just trips a little bit, they said, and they were watching him and train hit him. You say, what happened? Well, he just cut it a little close. He didn't take into consideration, you might trip. Well, preacher, that's a silly illustration. Some of you spend your life jumping trains. And God warned you there's a train coming. There's a train coming. You know, it's a strange thing. You ever see the arms come down? You know what that means? That means there's a train coming and there's plenty of time now for you to stop. Just put it in park and wait. What they're doing. Why, are they, why do I have to wait that long? They're taking into consideration all the things that could happen if they wait to the last minute to drop that arm. You say what? Invariably, invariably, there will be somebody that'll pull out from behind that thing and they'll go around the arm and the next thing you're reading about them in the newspaper. Well, the Lord's dropped the arm on several of you, hasn't he? Well, you ain't afraid of the train. You think you're going to beat it. You've always beaten it in the past. And what you have to do is so much more important. Well, now you're not doing anything. You say, why? You got hit by the train. Be not deceived. God is not mocked. You're not going to continue to mock him. And the Lord not just say, okay, tried to tell you. And that one time I made it, I've made it, I've made it. Then you trip and it's just a little bit, but it's just enough to make the time and just right. Next thing you know, your history, you're a greasy spot. He's out there off of uh, Normandy when a guy drove out. They said he was four cars back when we got there. That thing was pushed. I don't, I don't remember how many. They pulled tapes on it and all that stuff. It was several hundred feet pushed down that, by that uh, uh, big cattle thing on the front of it. You know, that cow catcher thing on the front of it. That, that thing, and that Amtrak hit that car. I mean, dead center broadside, man, and shoved that thing like garbage all the way down until it was able to finally stop. Of course, it crushed the guy on the inside. So you go get all the witnesses and everything that are there. You know what every one of them said? <laughs> He's dead, right? Well, that idiot was back there and he drove around everybody and blew the horn and he decided to get on and go. He went right on around the arms. And I'm thinking... Well, now, now you're going to say, well, why didn't they slow the train down? Here's how modern society works. Well, the train should have done something, and it's the train's fault, and the train should have slowed down. And uh, the train, every time it approaches an intersection, should, should be running four miles an hour so that if somebody does drive around the arm, they should drop a steel cage down there and to be able to prevent you from being able to drive around that. And they say, wait a minute, the idiot drove around the warning. Right now, you would don't appreciate that, but if all of a sudden they change it and make it about the train, and they got to put all these things in there to protect you from idiots, you're going to be the one sitting in traffic for 45 minutes because the train's coming along, moving at about three miles an hour, so that when the idiot comes out there to just barely to push their car up, and then you're going to be mad about that. 
You say, what is it? There's certain things that God writes to you. He drops the arm, but he gives you the liberty if you want to drive around it, you can. But don't be griping if you drive around it and you get hit by the train. You say, what does that mean? Warning. Warning. We used to carry ropes and stuff. This is years ago, road motors and all that. And they'd have the trains would come by and sometimes the arms would get stuck down. And, and this one elderly lady pulled up there to the traffic arm over there on Beaver Street. And I got over there and I got the stuff out. And, you know, and I'm, I'm walking up there and I'm, st I'm still looking because I'm like, it's down for a reason, you know. I don't want to be the idiot tying the arm up, and let the people die. And then the train comes, right? And so I go to the lady there and I got it tied up there. And she said, uh, what have you done? And I said, well, I just tied it up so y'all can go ahead and go through. She said, but the arm was down for a reason. And I said, yes, ma'am, it got stuck. And she says, yeah, but I'm not driving across there. The arm was down. That means the train's coming. I don't care if you tied it up or not. Amen. You say, what'd you do? Well, I put her in jail for being stupid. <laughs> no, she, she says, it came down for a reason. Just because you can't see the train doesn't mean it's not down for a reason. That elderly woman had some wisdom. She said, I tell you what I believe I'll do. And I said, what's that? She said, I believe I'll just go around. I said, ma'am, I'm telling you there's not a train. She said, well, I appreciate that. I believe I'll just go around. I could pick her out of a lineup right now. Old cotton top. Sitting there schooling a young man. Arm down for a reason there, sir. Don't you want to scoot across there? Mm-mm. Boy, you sure scoot across the tracks pretty regular, don't you? You say, why? You ain't afraid. The train's not going. It's never hit you to, up to now. Proverbs 15. No, 14. This is a good one. Verse 27, 26. The fear of the Lord is strong confidence, and His children shall have a place of refuge. The fear of the Lord is strong confidence. You say, what? If I'm afraid of the Lord, if, I'm, if I have the proper fear of the Lord, you know what that means? I can run to Him and be assured. I wanted to preach on those this morning, the cities of refuge, but I, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to preach on that, but I wanted to preach on that this morning. And I got that from this text here. The fear of the Lord is a strong confidence and it's a strong refuge. You say, what is that? I have confidence to know that when I run to Him, when I'm in trouble, He'll pick me up and take care of me. Amen. I don't have to worry about the ceiling being brass and Him not hearing me. Amen. I don't care how I feel about whether or not my prayers are getting through. How do you know they're not getting through? It's not about how you feel. He said it's a, you fear the Lord. You know what he said? You can have confidence and you got a refuge. Not a place of refuge. A person of refuge. You say, why? You got immediate access. Shut up. That's one of my kids that fear me. Let them in here. I can't remember a single time when I ever, I, I, maybe it happened, I don't remember. My dad was a pretty big dog. He had a, a, a bunch of people, big office and, you know, thousands of people and all this other kind of a deal. Uh, he was a pretty well-known individual. I can't remember any time from the time I was big enough to start remembering things that I ever went into wherever his office was. And he had some palatial offices and big offices and stuff like that and all. I can't remember a single time where he made me wait out there with the secretary or made me not come back there to his office. I don't care who he was meeting with. One day he's meeting there with Beverly, uh, George, uh, brother uh, George Beverly Shea and Cliff Barrows, who was uh, Billy Graham's second man at East Lake Baptist Church up there in uh, Tennessee, in Chattanooga, Tennessee. And I remember coming down there and uh, stood at the door there for a second. I was careful to not to interrupt. And my, I remember my dad saying, come on in, bud. And he's talking to these big dogs. Come on in, bud. I want you to meet somebody. Introduce me to them. If I'd have known all that, I'd have took a picture and sold them for something later on, you know. But, <laughs> but I can't remember ever my dad telling me, uh, uh, ever, ever making me wait like it wasn't important. I, I knew I had a place of refuge even when I messed up. But you know where that came from? I was afraid of him. I was afraid to do wrong. I was afraid my daddy would blister my hind end. You say, what did it do? It developed a place of refuge for me. I knew he was always looking out for me. I appreciated his discipline. You know why? Because I knew it was more about me than it was about his reputation. 
My dad didn't care how it looked to everybody else. He wasn't embarrassed about his boy acting the fool. He'll correct his boy and he'll still be with his boy later on after all those other naysayers are gone. Amen. Yep. Amen. You say, what is that? It's a place of refuge. Amen. Confidence. I can run to him. I can talk to him about it. I'm confident to know that when I go to him, he knows what's best for me. Sometimes it'll help me to ease out the way I need to ease out. Let me give you one more and we'll, we'll stop at this one. I'll finish this uh, tonight or a few of these tonight. The fear of the Lord is the fountain of life to depart from the snares of death. You know what he tells me? I'm smart if I'm afraid of the Lord. You say, why? It'll keep me from doing things that'll get me killed. Amen. You fear the Lord? Put the bottle down. You say, what is that? It's the fountain of life. God said you shouldn't do it. You say, why? It'll kill you. You fear the Lord? Put cigarette out. You fear the Lord? Stop going in places where you know He's not. So I appreciate that's just old school. No, that, that's wise school. <laughs> That you have to learn there's certain things and certain people and uh, stuff you can't do. You say, why? I'm afraid of it. You say, why? It'd kill me. Yes, sir. Graveyard dead. Father, bless your word and thank you for it. I pray you'll be with us in the upcoming service of these folks that are coming to join the Powells and the Owens that are going to be a part of our church. I thank you for the... Uh, um, a baptismal service that we're about to have. Pray you'll bless that. Thank you for a wonderful day today. And uh, we'd ask now your blessings upon what we've said this morning. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. amen. All right, uh, ladies, can I get you to maybe go uh, maybe to Brother Sam's office or uh, to uh, for your prayer meeting? I need my office because we got to get ready for that. And then uh, um, the Owens and the Powells, we got you joining this morning. Get you right after the baptismal service.
Good morning, good morning. Let's go ahead and stand, take our hymnals, and turn to page 126. Page 126. We'll sing Rock of Ages, Cleft for Me. Page 126. One twenty-six on the first now. Rock of ages, cleft for me. Let me Good morning, everyone. We're glad that you're here. Appreciate you being here. If you're wondering if you're visiting while we're uh, standing here in a baptismal pool and wearing a, a robe, it's for the purpose of a baptismal service. We do it as part of our service, as many of you already know. And the reason we do that is we think it's a significant part in a Christian's life when they publicly proclaim the name of Jesus Christ by the picture of their salvation and baptism. I do want you to clearly know that I think it's important for you to understand that all this is is a picture of what Rachel did as far as her salvation is concerned a long time ago. Uh, but because she didn't fully understand what was going on with her baptism, she came to me and asked if she could get uh, baptized again. There's nothing that precludes it. She's not getting saved again. But she has grown in her faith and she clearly knows that water doesn't save her. But I want you to know that just because that she is uh, doing this, I don't want you to get the impression that she's getting resaved or that she didn't think she was saved. She doesn't have any doubts about her salvation, but she does want to uh, to get baptized again and to set a good testimony. Something that's downplayed a little bit nowadays. As a matter of fact, even in Baptist churches, people don't want to baptize any anymore because they think it's intrusive. Well, I think it's a, still a great thing. I think it's a biblical pre precedent. But I also believe it's a testimony of a good conscience toward God. I believe it shows that you're in subjection to what God would have you to do. And it's not an easy thing to do. But when a grown woman comes and says, I was too young to fully understand what went on and I'd like to just do this again publicly, uh, it is not something to be taken lightly. So with that, Miss Rachel Lynn, if you would come down. This is now Rachel Lynn Honeyfield. If you were wondering if we were to turn the lights off right now, Joseph would be the one that would be glowing on the front row. <laughs> he married way above his pay grade. But you got a good one when he did. Rachel, have you trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. And do you clearly understand that this water doesn't save you? Yes. I want you to know personally as your pastor and having known you for years, it is a real honor to have watched everything you've been through and the testimony that you've had during all of it and up to and including even your marriage. In obedience to the command of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and Rachel upon your profession of faith in Him, I baptize you, my sister in Christ, in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Let's go ahead and 
Heritage Baptist Church. It's a blessing to have everybody here and uh, be a part of a baptism this morning. It's, it's, a, it's a blessing. We also, I think we've got some folks that are joining the church as well today. Really good Sunday here. Um, we, but if you're visiting with us here today, it's, it's good to have you here. And please let us know if you need anything at all. Um, hopefully, as you came in this morning, one of the ushers saw you coming in and, and got a visitor packet to you that has a little bit more information about our church, about who we are as a church and what we believe. Also, you'll notice in that packet, if you got one little white visitor card, if you wouldn't mind filling that out, drop it in the offering plate, as it's just about to come by in a moment here, we'd like to be able to have a record of your visit. We appreciate you doing that for us. Um, all right, we'll have the men come on forward and take up our morning offering. I think as preachers getting ready here, we'll have Miss Coger, will you come up and sing for the offering for us, please? Um, we'll have the men take up the offering. Uh, yes, sir, Brother Brett. Um, let me get this microphone here. So if you have IOUs out, what, what were those for? Was it for the builder? Was it for the missionary? Okay, for the Anderson family. So if you have an IOU out from the Anderson family, please, just a reminder, turn those in. We turned ours in, right? <laughs> okay. Okay. We're all, we're all clear? You haven't gotten it yet? Okay. Checks in the mail. Um, promise. Okay. Um, so we need to turn in our IOUs is what we need to do. Um, so, all right, pray for me, please, uh, Brother Chase, as you're down there. Um, would you uh, open us in prayer, please, and we'll uh, have Miss Coker come and sing for us. change just real quick and give you a couple of announcements and then that way we can get on with the spiritual stuff uh, after that um, what if I could have uh, brother Sam and Miss Mary if y'all will come on down please brother Roger if you'll turn on the air conditioner please and uh, Dustin and Shelby come on down is Ryder in the nursery okay bring him on down please these folks want to become a part of our church. And so you get the benefit of, I know you're waiting now. You can't wait for Miss Coker to sing and you're all sitting there. Wow, wait a minute. You just have to hang on for a second or two longer. But uh, we're going to have them give you a word of testimony here and they want to become a part of us. And uh, we want to make that part of the service to follow that. So um, come on down if you would, please. Dustin, you and Shelby and Ryder. Um, Brother, Brother Powell, Miss Mary, if y'all would just step this way just a little bit. And uh, Brother Powell, I'll give you an opportunity if you'd like to have a word of testimony there for you and your sister there, or you and your wife, excuse me. <laughs> I get the call. She said I have permission to say something, okay? So we want to thank you for uh, accepting us in the church here because it's a Bible-believing church that preached the truth. And uh, both of us have been saved for many years and we have been in, in, in church all the time, okay? So we, we pretty well know a lot of the Word of God, but when you come here, you get it straight and without any agenda to it, okay? That's number one thing. There's no agenda except there is an agenda to get everybody closer to God, okay? That's it. And that's the main thing. And uh, my wife and I, so we've been <coughs> wanting to find a church <coughs> and be honest with We travel from the East Coast to the West Coast, but we do certain things. And it's hard to find a church that, that preaches the Word of God. Amen. Seriously, I mean, I mean, we travel so we know. And it's so disappointing to travel to out west and go to a church and, and people not get the Word of God. And it, it breaks our heart. I'm serious. You, if you go often enough and you see that and the false doctrine that is preached, and it's usually about control. The fear is not of God like he spoke this morning. The fear is of not been accepted in the church and crossing the line you shouldn't cross and you get kind of uh, brainwashed 
And we see people like that when we travel, and it just breaks our heart because God loves us all, and he leads, he doesn't push. And you want to say something? Nope. I think not. That's so unusual. <laughs> Sorry about that. I just I'm made busy this all afternoon, the women. but I'll <laughs> open it up next week for counseling. So, <laughs> Brother Dustin, you or Miss Shelby have something to say. Most of you know Shelby Lou here, but uh, this is their baby rider. Brother, you want to go ahead and say something? Yeah, absolutely. Um, I'm just blessed to be able to join a church that's God-fearing. And um, growing up in church and, you know, being saved at a young age, I uh, can admit that I fell out of fellowship for a while. And... It's nice to kind of get back into it and really feel the Holy Spirit grow in me and my family. And I'm uh, happy to watch my baby boy and whoever else is to come uh, grow up and be God-fearing just like everybody else in here. Hi. Uh, some of you might know me as a former Crumpton. My parents are Eddie and Jennifer Crumpton. I'm now in Owens. Um, it's just a blessing to see so many like faithful families that I grew up with, knowing all my Sunday school teachers, the Roushes, the Whites, the Cokers, the Chases, of course the Magdalens, Preacher, Miss Drina, so many people who just shaped me as a person in my life, and I'm just I'm very grateful for this church. It's always been home for me, and I'm just happy to be married with a baby and to take him here and him have the same Sunday school teachers as me. That's just so cool. Um, just very grateful. And I love the Lord and I love Preacher and Miss Trina. Everybody here, youth camp, my whole life has just been amazing. And I'm just, I'm very grateful. And I love this church. All right. All in favor of having the Powells and the Owens become a part of us, let it be known by saying amen. amen. And anybody that is opposed by the same sign, there is none. I tell you what we're going to do. We'll do it quickly if we can, but I'd like for you all to remain here, if you would, please. Uh, and just quickly, if you would, just a few of you come up and welcome them in, and then we'll do that at the end of the service also, okay? Brother Larry, if you'll start off with them, just come on down. Oh, yes, ma'am. Go ahead. Take the picture. All right. Real quickly, just a few of you, if you'll come up, and then at the end of the service, we'll do it while everybody's getting their babies.
Let's do that. Let's get this. Miss Pat, let's go ahead and sing. While y'all keep on coming here, and let's sing a song while they're uh, while they're welcoming these these folks. Let's sing page 127. Hallelujah! What a Savior. Page 127. You're singing this next week, right? Are you singing this next week? <laughs> Possibly singing it next week? Okay, let's do page 49. Let's turn to page 49. The choir may be singing this next week. So let's turn to page 49 and sing Our Great Savior. It's a really good song here. Page 49. Jesus, what a friend for sinners. Jesus, lover of my soul. If anybody else wants to come down and welcome these folks here, you can do that while we're singing the first now. Jesus was a friend for sinners. Jesus fishing in storms and they said here's the thing let's talk about three different people let's talk about a family man that's going out in a boat fishing and let's talk about a charter that's going out on a boat and let's talk about a guy who's who knows what he's doing a pilot who's out there a tournament fisher they said if it's blowing really really strong really strong then the family man needs to stay home he's not going out there and if it's a charter he's not going out there fishing as well and he said but if it's a a pilot who's going out there, a captain who's going, who's going to be fishing for money, he's got something on the line, he's going out there, it doesn't matter if it's a tropical storm or a hurricane, he's going out there in the storm. And I just thought that is just like our Savior Jesus Christ, where there's people that are in your life that, that won't be able to go through you, go with you through every storm. But he, my pilot, he goes through every single storm. Doesn't matter if it's a hurricane blowing through, he's going to be out there and he's going to be in the middle of the storm right there with you. Let's look at this fifth verse here. Jesus, I do now receive him more than all in him I find on the last now. Jesus, I
Mr. Esley, just a couple announcements here. All right, just a couple of things now. I cannot thank you enough. I understand there was close to 40 people that were here yesterday and uh, getting things done that need to be done uh, next door. And the way things are right now, barring any some kind of major something we don't know about, uh, you'll have your first service over there next Sunday, which is resurrection morning, and no better time than to have that service over there. Now, remember, when we move over there, there'll be some adjustments and things that go along with it, but you folks have done an amazing job and have continued to give and take care of what was necessary to get us in there. And so uh, next Sunday, you'll be going in there. Now, there's still a lot of things that aren't finished. Brother Allen, I saw him, is here. Uh, Brother Talent's here from uh, up in Georgia. They're friends of ours from up in North Georgia, and they're bringing uh, full crews down here to help this uh, week. Brother Roger's been working on what he can, but you've got, I don't know, something like 20,000 feet of, uh, of nothing but baseboard to run in there. So... Uh, one man can't do all of that, but that's done. The cokers have got the uh, columns ready to go in. So these fellows will do that, finish up the doors and stuff this week. By this time next week, you'll see an entirely different transformation over there. And uh, I can't thank you enough, though, for the work being done. Every little integral part of everything, including scrubbing bathrooms and cleaning tiles and all that stuff. It's just appreciated more than you can possibly imagine. And I'm really looking forward to that uh, service. Now, next week when you come, don't expect bunnies and eggs. Uh, man, it's a good time to buy your wife a new dress because they're on sale. But, you know, if you're coming because of other things that you're expecting that we're going to have an Easter egg hunt or something, that won't be here. But we're going to do our best to find Jesus. Amen. And uh, so I hope you'll come and be a part of that. Now, next week we'll meet over there, but your Sunday school classes and nursery will still be right where they are right now until we get all the transitions and stuff made uh, in that particular thing. They have the uh, annual resurrection morning breakfast. That'll be back there. They're still missing some food on the food sheet. So if you could take the time to go through the foyer and uh, sign that uh, sheet and bring some of that food, we would really appreciate that very much. If you would just bring the items that are missing there. Brother Lance, you're still on for next week for the 31st for the choir to sing. Be plenty of room to stretch out in the new building over there. Uh, recruits and soldiers are meeting 345 today. Good? Okay. All right. And I uh, have to look in three or four places, so to make sure I don't offend anybody. So. Uh, now, let me give you a couple of things here, and we're going to put some information. This includes individuals that are uh, listening online. If you have questions about the uh, uh, Navajo mission and the things going on June the 17th, to I believe it's the 21st or 22nd, you need to see Brother David. Uh, um, Drina's prepared a sheet out there for you to sign, and it just has some basic information so that when you get out there, they have the ability to make sure they have numbers as far as feeding is concerned and as far as teenage uh, activities and those things. If you would please, even if you took a packet of information, if you'd please uh, put your name down, that'll help the Oakums to be able to do that. And if you're listening online, I haven't had a chance yet to get with Brother Sam, but we'll get a place where you can go get his email address and his phone number, and then you can contact them directly uh, so that you can let them know if you're going to be there coming for the uh, for that meeting that's going to be out there in uh, in June. Um, okay, real quick, um, just a brief update. I, I uh, sent you an email yesterday to give you some of the information that's going on with uh, Drina Lynn, and uh, I, I don't want to belabor the point, nor do I want to take advantage uh, of the situation and be a downer. What she has as was listed there, it's very serious. She's starting treatments immediately. We're not sure how she's going to tolerate the treatments. Um, hopefully it won't be as bad as it was a few years ago. They've had some new things that have happened, but uh, we can't even begin to thank you for the calls, the texts, the emails, the, the, the flowers, the food, the, the cards, the gifts, the stuff. It's, it's to the point of like it's just humbling uh, all the things that uh, every time we show up there's something else piled up at the door and uh, we have been in and out of doctors offices and hospitals back and forth and back and forth we came in uh, on Thursday went directly to the pulmonologist and didn't get uh, what we were hoping to get there and then the oncologist on Friday and then we'll be back in there this coming week so uh, all of that being said what she has is very serious if you're sick if you could do me a favor and stay away from her 
Uh, I would really appreciate that. Uh, she definitely had double pneumonia when this whole thing started, which is sort of what tripped the trigger to enable us to find what's going on. Uh, so, so the Lord's hands even in the sickness there, but can't afford to get sick now while she's in treatment. Uh, her immune system is severely depressed, but uh, I couldn't keep her from coming to church today. I guess I could have if I'd have got out my handcuffs, but uh, she was insistent on coming, but you'll see her sporadically. If you're working with her, you're not, you're not helping her by dodging her. Just keep working with her, send her an email, stay in touch with her, and those kind of things. She's gonna work as long as she can work, and we're hoping that that's a lengthy time. I want you to know this. We have gotten conflicting things, and um, the doctors won't give you a time frame, um, but I, I, I feel that the thing is in the Lord's hands. We're going to do our part to do what the Lord wants us to do, to try to give her the quality of life that we can and put the rest in the Lord's hands. And so in the meantime, you know, treating her like you've always treated her is wonderful, but you don't have to handle her with kid gloves. When she gets to the point where if she gets to that point, uh, I'll see to it that she stays home, but she... She's not a uh, look for a reason to stay out of church person. She wants to be here. And so she's still working behind the scenes and doing stuff. So um, I think that's probably all I really want to say about it right now. Y'all are our church family. Um, and so you, you kind of need to know what's going on there. Uh, my schedule, I'm, I'm, I'm home until we see what uh, happens. Um, she's, I don't know if she's like ready for, for me to get back out for a reason. Maybe she's like, <laughs> You need to get back out there. I'm like, hey, this is really serious. I know, but maybe you should go, you know. And <laughs> but um, uh, to be honest with you, it's been uh, it's it's pretty sad, and uh, to think about what could be and what can happen, and and those kind of things. So if you'll just continue to pray for us there, we would really appreciate it. Uh, and uh, let her do what you can. Just uh, you know, let let her let her keep going. Her, on her bucket list is, is she wants to finish the building. You know, I'm like, hey, would you like to go to Alaska? Or you want to go see, like, the Grand Canyon? Or do you want to, like, you know, you think about that stuff. Maybe y'all don't, but, you know, it's like all the things that I should have done I didn't do, probably out of guilt. But at any rate, and she's like, no, the only thing I'd really like to do right now is to spend more time with you and finish the building. So I said, okay, well, maybe we can, you know, stoke the fire there and get that done. So... There you go. Miss Coker, thank you for allowing me to move you out of the way for just a moment and adding some beauty to this side of the room. <laughs> you come sing for us if you would, please. Stop. 
scarred feet and praise the Lord he did it all for me he did it all for me each drop of blood he shed for even me when the sand drop of blood he shed for even me when the Savior cried bowed his head and died oh praise the Lord he did it all for me oh praise the Cheer the heart like Jesus by his presence all divine, true and tender, pure and precious. Oh, how blessed to call him mine! Love of Christ so freely given, grace in God beyond degree. Mercy higher than the heaven, deeper than the deepest sea. All oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus. He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. What a wonderful redemption, never can a mortal know. How my sin left red like crimson can be whiter than the snow. All oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus, He is more than life to me. The fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see every need his hand supplying, every good in him I see on his strength divine relying, he is all in all to me. By the crystal flowing river, with the ransom I will sing, and forever and forever praise and glorify the King. All oh, that thrills my soul is Jesus, He is more than life to me. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see. And the fairest of ten thousand in my blessed Lord I see.
All right, that's called old school singing. Not from old people, but old school. You don't feel like doing something you shouldn't be doing with that kind of singing. Where's Rachel Lou at? Sorry to embarrass you. I know that you are quite shy. But here is your certificate, and your husband has tons of video. <laughs> so he'll never forget it. It's a real privilege, young lady. Thank you very much. What a great testimony. All right. Luke chapter number 14. I'll be honest with you now. I'm even speaking to you now as your pastor and uh, riding this thing that we we're going through right now is a little bit. Uh, it's like riding a wave. It comes and goes, and uh, things look like pretty good and feel pretty good, and everything's run along pretty good. And then literally all of a sudden things change, and um, and so it just. I, I hope you'll be tolerant and gracious with me, and um, I'm do my best to keep feeding you, putting some food in the trough. If not, I've got a real good bullpen, and uh, I'm I'm not trying to. Uh, to, to prove anything. I'm going to do what I feel like the Lord will allow me to do, but I'm not here. If, if you don't know by now that I love you, uh, I don't think I'm going to convince you by being here when I need to be with her. And uh, if, uh, if the need comes and that time occurs, then I'm going to be there, and I hope that you'll be gracious with me and understand that that's not our MO. This is a hard adjustment for us. We're, uh, we feel like as long as we can crawl, we ought to be here. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a difficult thing with all that stuff that happens. And so you, you uh, pray that the Lord will give us the wisdom and all that kind of stuff. But I'm, I'm, I'm telling you now, and a lot of you have already approached me about it. Uh, I, I can assure you, I promise you, I've listened to the men around me. Um, when, the, when the time comes, if the time comes, uh, that I need to be with her, I'm going to be with her. So I'm not in a hurry to try to prove how spiritual we are. If our time is limited, and it very well may be, uh, then I, you know, want to, I want to spend as much time with her as I can. And, um, and so just letting you know, I'm, if, if I'm not here, it doesn't necessarily mean everything's a calamity. I just need to be there. So, all right, Luke chapter number 14, do my best to try to stay off of this. It's hard not to be preaching about it when you're going through it. Um, and so uh, if you would take your Bible, look in Luke chapter 14, you're familiar with the passage here about the great supper, but I'm going to come at it in a little bit of a different angle, if you'll tolerate me here for just a little while this morning. Verse 16, Then said he unto him, A certain man bade a great supper, and bade me, made a great supper, and bade many, and sent his servant to supper time, to say to them that were bidden to come, For all things are now ready. And they all, with one excuse, consent, began to make excuse. The first said unto him, I bought a piece of ground, and I must needs go and see it. I pray, have, thee me, have me excused. Another said, I bought five yoke of oxen. I go to prove them. I pray thee, have me excused. Another said, I've married a wife, therefore I cannot come. He didn't even make an excuse. He just said, I'm, I'm married. It ain't happening. You know, so, I mean, that's, that's pretty rude. At least the other one said, hey, I got to do this for a reason. He's like, I'm married a wife. Get it? You know, so... So the servant came and showed the, his Lord these things. Then the master of the house, being angry, said to the servant, Go out quickly into the streets, the lanes in the city, and bring hither the poor, and the maimed, and the halt, and the blind. And the servant said, Lord, it is done that thou hast commanded, yet there is room. And the Lord said unto the servant, Go out to the highways and the hedges, compel them to come in, that my house may be filled. For I say unto you, that none of those men which were bidden shall taste of my supper. Brother Larry, take us to the throne room, please. Father, thank you. It sounds so repetitive, Lord, but we do thank you continually, Lord, for being here for this place at 3857 with what you provided. Uh, and we're, we're, we're grateful, Lord, first of all, in this prayer, the Lord, that uh, we don't have to ask to come into your presence, Lord, for we feel you here. And we're so grateful and don't want to take it ever for granted for your presence here. Thank you for the songs that have been sung. Lord, I thank you for an old-fashioned type setting. Amen. God, the old, the old songs of the, of the faith. And Lord, uh, even, even sung from folks uh, even of the aged. And we praise your name for that. We thank you, Lord, that the young people as well can hear these songs. That lift you up and glorify your precious name. We come to the meeting. And pray for your man. I pray for your preacher. 
our preacher, God. I lift him up before you. And God, it be is the best we know how to utter words. Our Lord, we ask you for help for him. I pray you preach him. I pray the words that you've given him in message. I pray they be vivid on his mind. God, I pray his his voice will be clear. I pray his crawl would have that built up in him of the Spirit of God. I pray you'd use him one more time. We thank you for what you do in this place. I know there's other places get preaching, and I know there's other churches, and I pray for those that are that are Bible believers. Uh, Church is preaching today, but we're here. And we need you. All the events of our life, the circumstances, I thank you, Lord, that you're a great comforter. Amen. And I think you give us exactly what we need every time we meet here. Amen. And we're going to raise you up and lift you up and point you out today. May, your fo may the focus be totally on you. Use your man and word in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. 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 Thank you. You can be seated. Generally, the way we go about the passage is... You take a look at those three things and say the excuses are of no count or they're of none accord. They're silly excuses. But I want to go a little bit further than just saying that this morning. I'd like to say this. Oftentimes when we look at the passage, we don't consider the one who's made the preparation. We don't pause and think that before he went to ask, he realized that what he was doing was asking for the purpose of being able to determine to make sure that everything and everyone that was there had all of their needs met. In other words, they had the ability to, when they showed up there, the right amount of salad and the right amount of hors d'oeuvres, the right amount of, uh, of the main course, the right amount of desserts, the right amount of things along those lines. All of that stuff being laid out, the responsibility for doing that was on the master of the house. If you can imagine that once he went out there, he was very well known and no one would want to turn down an invitation to go to that of the, that big huge event that was going to transpire, that event that was going to take place there. And once they all said they would come, they basically put their name in and said, I'll be glad to be there. They've RSVP'd. Is that a good way to say that? They've said, I'm coming, count me in, get my plus one, whatever it might be, and gave him the numbers. And immediately what happens is the master of the house begins to take count of those numbers and said, what do I need to do to make sure we have enough room at the table and make sure that all all the needs are met for these individuals, much like you did when it came time for us to have the Jubilee. I mean, I know you were absolutely surprised by the fact that I prayed for 800 and 600 showed up, but I mean, I guess I was a little off, but still 600 people that you flipped things around and prepared everything from toilet tissue to forks and knives and all the other things that came along with that and made that transition. It required a lot of effort. To be able to do that and then at nighttime flip the thing around and get it ready to go again for the next morning. And then at the end of the morning get it ready to go again for the nighttime. It required a lot of effort. Much like at a wedding. The wedding itself is really not as big of a deal as the reception is. You say, why? Well, the wedding, you roll out a runner, you have a wedding rehearsal, uh, the preacher says a few things, and, and it's pretty much done after the pictures are taken, right? And there's usually plenty of room for everybody to sit. But when it comes time for the reception, you're starting to talk major dollars. I mean, that's why oftentimes they have a funeral at 2 o'clock in the afternoon. That way you don't have to worry about trying to feed people lunch after they're finished with the funeral service. You say, why? Repass can be expensive. When people come by after the service is over, that's kind of humorous if you think about it, but expenses become a part of the equation. It costs a lot to put on this. And of course you realize the picture is, here's the Lord who's paid a great price in order to even give you an opportunity, John 14, the mansion that's there for you, for you to even be able to come and to sit at that table. He's had to pay a great price. But can I say this to you? The time that it took for him to prepare this place in context, have you ever paused to consider that when these individuals say, hey, I'm coming, and then they said, I've changed my mind, something came up, that they never considered the preparation that was made the expectation, the expectancy of them arriving, they never paused to say, hey, you know what? However much it costs you to prepare a place for me, I'm willing to reimburse you because I'm not able to be able to be there. Now how often? I don't know. You probably get them in the mail on a regular basis where you tell somebody, <coughs> excuse me, 
You tell somebody that you'll plan on being at their wedding or maybe at their graduation or something along those lines and they make preparations for you to be there. And then the time comes for you to be there and something else has come up and now all of a sudden they've planned on you being there and now you send back to them if you even bother to contact them and say, I can't come. Have you ever not only considered the preparation that was made, but have you ever considered the feelings of the one that prepared it? Have you ever think for just a moment how it must make the individual where you were so excited to say, I'll be glad to be there, and yes, count me in and I'll be there, and then to simply say, you know, sorry, something else, something, in, it's minuscule to the ever, whatever the excuse is, I'm never even considering the feelings of the person that's no longer going to be able to be there. You say, well, well, I didn't really care enough. Something else that I wanted to do came up and was better than what I was going to do when I was there. I don't know if you've ever paused to even ponder or even think about it for just a moment that when the Lord first sent out His servant and said, hey, tell them to come, it's now ready, that every one of them had one thing in common. They were ready when they were first asked to come. But now they're not ready. If I were to title this, I would say, I'm not ready now. Or I'm not ready yet. Remember the man over there in Luke chapter number 12? You have a, a, a parable there, the story where the Lord goes there and he says the rich man goes out there and, and his harvest has come in and he has to tear down. He's looking at his harvest. He doesn't have enough room to put all the food and stuff in, that's in there. And he sits back there after the harvest comes in and he looks and he says, man, I'll tell you what I'm going to have to do. I'm going to have to build bigger barns and I'm going to have to do more because if I keep having this kind of yield on my crops, man, my barns aren't big enough to hold them. I'll build bigger barns. And the Lord steps into that parable. You know what he says? Thou fool, knowest not that tonight thy soul shall be required of thee? I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready now. Pausing, contemplating, saying that when you got saved and you chose to do something for the Lord, suppose the Lord were to shorten the time. We oftentimes don't even think of that. We think, well, Lord, that means I'll get saved and then I'll serve the Lord until I get to be old and then when I get old and decrepit and I'm, I'll take control of how... You can't take control of how you die. That's in God's hands. And when you die, that's in God's hands. I understand the, the exceptions to the rules, ladies and gentlemen, but what you have to recognize is, is that we're so quick to say, I'm ready to go if I can go right now. But after a while, things begin to get in our way and things begin to be, make life more complicated and, and we become more uh, uh, slow to say, well, I'm ready to go, but you know, if I could just get this done first, I, I need to get this built. I need to get this promotion. I need to get married. I need to have children. I, I need to have this this car. I need to have this place. I, I need to, whatever you fill in the blank with, and if the Lord were to come to you tonight and say, hey, tonight, Lord, I'm ready, just not right now. I have so many other things that I want to do. That chicken comes home to roost. Are you really ready? I mean, if you read over there, we go a little bit further in Luke chapter number 16 there. And when you come in that passage on Luke chapter number 16, you have two guys there that die on the same day, a rich man and Lazarus. And the rich man in hell lifts up his eyes and says to, to the Abraham, he says, send Lazarus to dip his finger in the, in the water and come cool my tongue for I'm tormented in the flame. And Lazarus is over in Abraham's bosom. Neither one of them had the opportunity. The rich man, I guarantee you, didn't think he'd die the same day as the beggar died. Right. Nonetheless, I'm ready. Just not right now. I can remember times in my own life that I felt like the Lord was dealing with me about certain things and I tried to sort of make deals and tried to say, now Lord, I'll be willing to do that if I could go ahead and do it. And I made a commitment. And then the Lord didn't have me do something with it at the moment. And then later on, as if a trial was coming my way to say, hey, you remember you told me you'd be willing to go to so-and-so well, uh, yes, sir, Lord. Uh, but that was then. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm busy now. I got other things going on now. 
I got things that matter more to me now than the commitment I made when I didn't have all these things of such great importance. Maybe you're not in that fashion, but it doesn't take long. Listen, it's easy to make a commitment when you don't have anything to commit. That's why it's so important that if the Lord deals with you about a calling, whether it's to the mission field or to preach or to school, it's good for you to go ahead and act upon it then. You say, why? Because stuff gets in the way. And then the Lord says, hey, how about now? And you're like, Lord, I, I, but you said you'd come. You said you would come. It's ready. Come on. Uh... Lord, I'd like to, but listen, I, I bought this piece of land and I, I really need to go see what I bought. What'd you do, buy it in the dark? The, the, the intention of the parable is to show you how silly any of our excuses are that the master of the house has prepared now a great feast, a great banquet, and he's done it, and you're going to be the guest of honor. And he's now said, okay, you said you'd come. I got it ready. Come on. And how quickly we're saying, Lord, I'd love to, but you know what? I know it's Sunday, but I just have something else to do, somewhere else to be, and something else to see. Lord, I got I to gotta check a piece of land. That may sound like a good excuse to you, but I guess no matter what, if you don't want to go, any excuse will do. Because it doesn't really matter. The fact is, is that you've changed from the time you said you would to the time that He asked you to come. I want to ask you this morning, if the Lord were to call you, I, listen, I pray for the rapture. I wish now, especially now, I think it'd be great. <laughs> I mean, the window opens up next week. I'll be starting to pray and ask the Lord, you know, about 6 o'clock on uh, Saturday night for the Lord to blow the horn and us get out of here. That's when He came out of the tomb and run that thing for 50 days and pray every single day all the way up through Pentecost and all that. Well, why do you do that? I think the Lord's going to come in the springtime. He could come anytime. I pray that the rapture would happen. You say, why? We all get to go together. You know, the hard thing to go is, is He's not dealing with everybody here. He's dealing with individuals. He's saying the time to come is now for you. It's your time. That's a rough row to hoe. You, row, right? You understand that? You under, like we're talking about a garden? That's a rough row to hoe. You say, why? Wow, it's, it's, it's hard ground. It's got a lot of weeds in it. It's a, it's a difficult thing to do. In here, ladies and gentlemen, he's not talking about a crowd or a nation. He's talking about an individual. He's saying to you, I've decided that I'm ready for you to come home now. Are you ready? Lord, I'm ready to go. I can't wait to go. Man, I sure would love to see you, man. I can't wait to hear him say, boy, I've just seen Jesus. Boy, what a blessing. Can't wait to get there. Okay, good. Come on, let's go. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Ho, wait. Hold on. I, don't, I didn't mean right now. I'm ready, just not right now. This doesn't fit in with my plan. This isn't how I drew it up. I'm not in control. I told you when I would come, I expected you to sort of give me a little heads up so that I would find out if it fits in my daytimer. You know what I've learned about the Lord? I've learned that death can't be put on a daytimer. I've learned that with a phone call, yes. with a conversation, life can change instantaneously and everything that you had planned, all of a sudden it's like, you don't have control over that anymore. Right. No matter how hard you plan, you say, what are you pushing me for? I'll jump to the end, then I'm going to come back to the middle, okay? I hope the rapture happens soon. Amen. But the fact of the matter is, if history is proving itself, we may have a ways to go yet. Yeah. I hope not. I don't figure it all out and figure out how many years I'm all for you doing all that stuff. Here's what I'm here to say to you. If, ladies and gentlemen, that's something that affects us corporately. What if God said to you today, supper's ready, ready to come to the house? Not just ready, ladies and gentlemen, in the sense of I'm saved, I know where I'm going when I die. Are you ready to meet your Savior, Jesus Christ, today and say, if He puts a time stamp on me today and said, that's the end of your life as you know it, are you ready to meet Him today? 
Well, uh, preacher, hold on just a minute. I know, I know. You, you were ready when you got saved. Just not now. Don't have any control over the now. If he chooses for that to transpire or for that to take place, it won't matter about your materialistic holdings or whatever your dreams, ambitions were, whatever your, your idea about promotions were, however you drew it up. All of a sudden the Lord said, I'm ready for you to come home now. Would you be ready? Oh, preacher, nobody's really ready. I can tell you by that statement, you're not ready. You're ready in the sense of eternity. You're ready to miss hell. But you know what? You don't realize the seriousness of the fact that the Lord has been up there and has prepared a place for you. You are going to be the bride of Christ for all of eternity. You are going to be set apart and become more and more rare, as one fellow said, and more and more rare as time goes on. And you're going to meet your Savior and you're not in control of the timeline. And if he said today, hey, supper's ready for you. Come on to the house. Would you be ready? Would you say, Lord, uh, I, I know I said I would come and I know I've told you repeatedly that I'm ready to go. Why, Lord, you know, the last funeral I was at, I said, thank God I'm saved. Thank God I, I, I'm ready when that comes. Yeah, but when, rush, when, when push comes to shove, when the rubber meets the road, is there something on your heart today that needs to be jettisoned before you meet Him tomorrow? Is there something that you would hate to go ahead and go to heaven today and have to square it up with Him once you got there? I hate to tell you, the misconception is, is that even though my sins are forgiven, they're far as the east is from the west, the idea that if I just die and I haven't confessed my sins, then I get to heaven, it's all good. It is as far as your salvation is concerned, but you're going to have to square up accounts with the Lord when you get there. You're ready, right? Just not today. You're ready in the sense of eternity. You're ready in the sense of your soul being saved. But are you ready in the sense of the judgment seat? Is it real enough to recognize that when you're checking the silk in the casket, when the final day has come, when you finally have, quote, come to rest, that you didn't control how you went out? The Lord reached down and decided on that particular day to go ahead and stop. Excuses are gone. Your heart stopped. What are you going to do now? You're going to stand there and face Him. You, there's no other, nothing else you can do. But there's going to be some things you're going to wish you had done. There's going to be some of the petty foolishness, just like these petty excuses that when you step into the presence of pure holiness and pure goodness and pure love, that you're going to feel like, man, I don't belong here. Amen. And some of the things that you made such a big deal out of all of a sudden shrink and the despair will overtake you and the tears will begin to fall and you will begin to say, Lord, I was ready, but just not now. Some of the things that we wind up thinking at the last minute because we've watched far too many movies, and way too many YouTube videos. We have too many things that are preconceived non-biblical notions in our mind that says, well, it'll all be good when the time comes. I've got plenty of time. Notice in the passage that he didn't give them a warning for when it occurs. He just says, dinner's ready, let's go. Supper's ready. You said you'd come, come on. Can I say this to you? From the time you get saved, ladies and gentlemen, until where you are now, you have no control over how many things will jump in the way and you do not know what will divert your attention from the most important thing. You know what, I've got some things going on here, but the Lord might call me at any minute. If he calls me, I have to drop it. One individual said to, wrote, I think it was Ann Landers, I got the illustration from somewhere, I think it was Ann Landers, what do you do if uh, the President of the United States asks you to come to a state dinner 
and you have a conflict on your calendar? Her reply was, there is no conflict. If the President of the United States asks you to come to dinner, there is no conflict. You go to the President. Well, you go to the one that you were singing about, your pilot, as you heard. And if he decides to call you, you know what you got to be doing? You got to be ready to go. In other words, you're living your life as if at any moment he's going to say, Supper's ready. Right. Yeah, but preacher, I'm only 18. There, that's not in the passage. Right. Preacher, I'm only 15. That's not in the passage. Preacher, I'm not married yet. That's not in the passage. Preacher, I haven't achieved what I need to achieve. I haven't made my mark in society. Not in the passage. You said you'd come. And he's the one that said, all right, come on. Oh, I'd love to turn the tables and make it about the Gentiles that get in and the highways and the hedges and the blind and the lame and, and those kind of things that get to fill up those slots. And I know where it fits dispensationally, but what I'm trying to drive home to you this morning is none of us are in control of the end date, the expiration date. Doesn't matter how clean you live. He lived a perfect life and died at 33. There's no guarantee. Our reason for living a clean life is so that if He says supper's ready, we're ready and washed up. We don't have to get cleaned up before time for supper. We're ready and living our life as if at any minute supper's ready. I'm ready to go. Honey, if uh, the master of the house calls and I'm out in the field and he says supper's ready, I just want you to know I'm not coming by the house. I'm going to the master's house. Amen. Honey, I want you to know if I'm on the road or in an airplane somewhere, if I'm over across or overseas and, and the master of the house, he calls, I want you to know I'm going to the dinner table. Amen. I'm not coming by the house. You can't count on me to come back home. Maybe she might say, honey, uh, while you're gone, the master of the house said, supper's ready. I just want you to know, love you, I'm going to supper. I'll see you at the supper table. I think the thing that is ringing the bells in my heart of hearts is, is the misconception that we have plenty of time. And so much preaching is done nowadays. It is such a waste of air in talking about things that are going on in the here and now and the right now as if we have the ability to change anything since it was like in the days of Noah. Right. Instead of recognizing that as a Christian, we are to be ready when the master of the house calls and said, Hey, supper is ready. Amen. Hey, I'm dropping whatever I'm doing. Time for me to go supper. Well, I didn't get an invitation. <laughs> you better get one while you can. I'm out of here. See you later. I've watched them go. I've seen the Lord ring the dinner bell. You know what's odd? He must be feeding in shifts up there. You ever notice that? He must feed in shifts. You say, why? He doesn't take everybody at the same time. Oh, it is so easy to let something so silly get between you and Him. It may not be land. It may not be oxen. It might be bitterness. It might be anger. It might be wrath. It might be hatred. It might be strife. It might be emulations. It might be jealousy. It might be hurt feelings. It might be something that says, Hey, I'm ready. Just not now. I'm not going now. The Lord said, well, you're not in control of that. As a matter of fact, when you read down through the passage, you know what you find out? When the servant comes back and says, hey, uh, Lord, I just want you to know, I, I went in and talked to him, and I told everyone that you asked to come that supper was ready. And he goes, okay, well, good. There must have been enough in the original invitation that it would have filled the entire house. Because he said after he went back out there, he said, Master, there's still room. Isn't that interesting? That means his first invitation would have encompassed enough people to have filled the Master's house to the full. You say, well, what was the problem? It wasn't the preparation. It wasn't the invitation. It was the people who made a promise 
and then took it back and said, I'm ready and I appreciate the invitation. And as long as nothing else comes up, I'll be there. But if something else happens, somebody makes me mad. I get in a twist over something and get my eyes off of Jesus. Forget about it. I'm not coming. Can I point out to you the manipulation of the people that are here? Can I say to you that their absence is speaking volumes and it is an attempt on the part of those individuals to say, you are not going to tell me when supper time's ready. You're going to feed me when I'm ready to be fed. And I'll let you know when that time is. Oh, how often, how many times has that occurred for Christians? You're just going to sin for a little season. Why? If the Lord rings the dinner bell during the supper, you know what you're saying? I don't care. No matter to me. I'll let him know when I'm ready to go. What if the Lord were to call you today? Are you ready? Uh, look, I'm not the one dying right now. I mean, I'm, I'm dying in a sense, but I'm not the one dying right now. I'm not thinking I'm going to meet him tomorrow. But what if I did? I don't know what it must feel like to somebody who has this constant thought and have been told your time is now limited. What would you change? Supper time's approaching. You think you can let maybe some of those things that you're holding on to as if you have eternity remaining? Do you think you could let those things go, jettison those things to be ready if supper time comes tonight? Would it even be possible to allow such silly excuses to stand between you and Him at the judgment seat of Christ? as if he's been a bad God, a bad father, a bad provider, an individual that hasn't done what he promised to do all the days of your life, and yet chooses to all of a sudden say, supper's ready. We had a rule in my house. You probably find that hard to believe after hearing the stories about my dad. We... Came home, had to get our homework done if we weren't playing ball or something. Homework was first. And then it was get out of the house. You, don't, you ain't staying in the house. You get out of the house, you go play in the woods, you go play down the road or whatever. Now I realize times are different. We didn't have pedophiles riding around the car picking up people and that kind of thing. Because back in those days, if they caught you out there, they never saw you again. So I've been told. But we didn't have the problem like now because... There, there was not anybody that was kind of leaning that way. If you were leaning that way, <laughs> that tree done fell over. And all of a sudden, what happened to that leaner? I, I'm just saying, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. Now it's like tolerated. Nowadays, you got to like put a beeper on your kid to make sure, you know, where's the kid going? All of a sudden, they're speeding up. It's like somebody done picked them up, you know. It wasn't that way. It was get out of the house. But here was the rule. Number one, you better be close enough to hear me whistle, boy. When I drive in the driveway at nighttime and say, that meant you better not be so far you can't hear me whistle. And that means you better jump on that swim bicycle with them gooseneck handlebars and that banana seat and them little playing cards down there. You better be paddling like nobody's business and you better be tearing up stumps to get back to the house. You say, why? Supper's ready. Daddy, I ain't done playing yet. Supper's ready. You want to get him upset. You know what happened? You get your hind end tore up for, for not being where you're supposed to be. Daddy, I didn't hear you. That ain't my fault. Amen. You know what it taught me? It taught me you better be close enough to be able to hear the whistle, not see how far I could get and still hear the whistle. I had to stay close enough so I made sure I heard the whistle. You say, why? He didn't whistle more than once. If you didn't show up, that car would be coming down the road. Boy. Uh-oh. And man, you all of a sudden, you lost your appetite. 
You didn't care about what was for supper. You didn't care if it was meatballs and scatty sauce. You didn't make the if it was roast beef and mashed potatoes and English peas and biscuits. Man, all of a sudden it's like something is in your stomach and you're like, I'm going to throw up. He's like, put your bicycle in there. Better still, I'll follow you. And he's right behind you and you're <laughs> It's like he's herding you back. And you get in there and you have to put it all up. You ever been there before? Supper's ready. You say, what? It was my responsibility to stay with an earshot. And my responsibility to come when he whistled. I didn't even get any choice. He just said, when I whistle, you better come running. I look at that right now and I think to myself, if the Lord whistled me up today, oh, I'd love to tell you. I'd love to tell you. Oh, I'm ready. Can't wait to see Jesus and, and get raptured out of here. Oh, what a glorious thing. But in my heart of hearts, I look in my life and I say, are you really ready? I mean, boy, that's such a good facade to put on, isn't it? I mean, I'm ready as far as my salvation is concerned. Do you understand? I know I'm saved. So, well, you don't act like it. I'm glad you're not the judge. <laughs> But ladies and gentlemen, I find out real quick how ready I am when just the slightest little wind begins to blow and it upsets my plans and my timeline. I'm, I'm strange about that. I actually am a list maker. I know you find that hard to believe, right? It's kind of like, really, imagine that, you know. I keep a timeline. I write things down. I have an order to things. I have an order to the way I study. She'll even make fun of me. She'll come up there and say, what you're doing right now is like somebody coming up there and moving all your books out of this and that and the other and, and make an illustration. You say, why? I can tell you where the books are in my library and what shelf they're on and what book you need to go to to pull out what illustration it is that you need because they're where I put them up the last time I used them. Right. She said, well, that's ridiculous. Okay, well, you do whatever works for you. I'm just telling me. But you know what happens? Somebody comes in and borrows a book. And immediately I'm like, it's a satanic attack. <laughs> the devil came in here and rearranged my books. And I make a plan every day for what I'm going to do during the day. And then all of a sudden, something happens, the phone rings, and literally at a phone call, my whole life changes. Literally, my life changes. I thank the Lord so much for how He brought me up since I was 19, having my life always at someone else's beck and call, and my life was controlled by the needs of other people. You say, what was that? The preacher said that was ministerial training for me, and that I must have been a really slow student because it took me over 20 years to learn what most people learn in three. That's what he said. That's funny. <laughs> but when all of a sudden I have these plans and the Lord says, Supper's ready. I got something I want you to do. It's outside of your norm. It's a, a, a dovetail that's going to branch off over here. But it's important to me. Can I interrupt your schedule? Man, you talk about a tailspin. And then I find out how my relationship is with him. Can he really control me? How many things would I have to offload if I stood up there at the gate and before I hit the judgment seat of Christ, the Lord says, anything you want to talk about? I've been thinking about that. Anything you want to talk about? You know, the misconception is, maybe not for you, but for me, is that I'll have plenty of time to fix all that. I think sometimes I'm more Catholic than I want to believe. I think it's like I'm going to be able to like give last rites. Brother Sam's going to come in and say, Preacher, is there anything you want to tell me? <laughs> yeah, get away from me with all them crosses, man. <laughs> God bless the preacher and forgive him of all these things he's now confessed to me. I, I think sometimes that I think I got that time. You know what's odd is, is that I've been very familiar with sudden supper time. Supper's ready now. Well, wait, 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 wait. I mean, I wanted to get washed up. I wanted to get fixed up. 
I wanted to get my do on, you know. I wanted to get, go see Brother Mitch, get trimmed up, right? New shop. And then I'm ready for supper. Lord, uh-uh. Supper's ready. You come like you are. That means I always have to stay in a state of preparedness. Amen. You just got that. I got to always be living my life as if he's going to call me to supper today Amen. in the next hour. Yeah. And if I do that, guess what happens? I don't have to worry about making excuses. I've been through this passage before and I, I look at it and I think to myself, how silly these illustrations are, how silly these excuses are. And eventually, you know what happens? The Lord says, and how silly are your excuses? And these are people that are saved under the law and don't get near what I've given you. And this is their silly excuses for not coming to suffer. And oh yeah, I'm angry with them because I paid the same price for them that I paid for you. But imagine if I paid that price for you and I call you to supper and you're not ready. How silly would your excuse be? I heard an old preacher preaching one time. He was actually preaching about the judgment seat and he was doing a really good job. I mean, it was kind of, it was, it was like pretty much like right down the pipe. And he wasn't hitting all the sins of the flesh and all the stuff, you know, smoking and drinking and cussing and all that kind of a deal. He was just talking about being ready at the judgment seat of Christ. And he said, you know what? There's two things I'd like to say. He was a pauser, an effective pauser. He said, there's two things I'd like to say. It's irritating, isn't it? I'm like, shoot, man, say it. It's like Percy Ray said, the problem with you dehydrated Baptist. Did the tape break? What? What's my problem? This guy's a pauser. Two things I'd like to say. Irritating. Number one, whatever reason you have not to come to Jesus Christ today, take out a piece of paper and write it down. Stick it in your pocket. And when you meet the Lord at the great white throne judgment, He had His judgments right. He said, I want you to reach in that pocket and pull out that excuse. And whatever that excuse is, you show it to Him and say... Not today. And I thought, that's a pretty effective illustration. And then he said, and that's for you Christians. Blood washed. Born again. King James only. Bible believers rightly dividing. If the Lord were to ring the dinner bell today, what excuse would you write down? to not be ready for the judgment seat of Christ. I was mad. Somebody hurt my feelings. I was bitter. I was angry. He listed them. And I thought, yeah, the second one of those two will fit me. The first one I'm not worried about. I'm saved now seven. I'm ready to go, just not now. I don't want to be at the point where I'm ready to go because things have gotten so bad that for me to stay is more painful than it is for me to go. I want to go out high stepping. I want to go out in good health. I want to go out breathing. I don't want to go out some decrepit, old, beat up old saint if the Lord sees fit. Oh, look, I'm not trying to be blasphemous. But in my heart, I want to be as ready to go healthy as I would be if I wasn't healthy. Is it making any sense to you at all? You're ready, aren't you? Just not today. What about the kids that will be left behind? What about the grandkids that will be left behind? What about the husband? What about the wife? What about the business? What about the job? What about the money? What about the car? What about this? What about that? What about, what about, what about, what about? The Lord's like, well, what about the guy that prepared supper? Amen. How silly will our excuses be when we finally get hauled up there to the judgment seat of Christ? And the Lord said, the Bible says, and they all began to make excuse. Their excuses are not even valid excuses. 
I want to ask you a question. Do you live your life as if today could be the last day? Does it even cross your mind? Can I say this to you? Until really recently, in spite of some of the things I've seen and done and been a part of and so on and so forth, can I say this to you? I won't really say that I think about going home every day. See, preacher, that's kind of like a little bit weird thinking about why. Why is that weird? I mean, sooner or later, we go the way of all the earth, right? Yes. Amen. What would be wrong with saying, Lord, if today's the day, I don't want to have all these superfluous, foolish, stupid things. I want to talk to you about real stuff and not silly stuff. He has to wait on the judgment seat when we get up there for everybody to be there. Why? He has to reserve, per, resolve personal conflicts. Can you imagine that? Of all the things going on in glory, he has to get a couple of saints together to get them on the same page. You say, preacher, what a silly excuse. No more silly than I got land, I got oxen, I got a wife. If the Lord were to call whistle today, a whistle today and call you to supper... Would you be ready? You can be. That Bible says if we confess our sins, He's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. That Bible says that you can be ready right now if He were to blow the horn today or if He were to decide to stop your heart today or if He were to allow you to be run over today or He were to give you a diagnosis today. You know what that Bible says? That Bible says you can be ready for supper no matter what time of the day He calls it. If you go ahead right now, right now, and you say, you know, Lord, there's some things I need to get squared away. I've sort of let some dust build up on some things. There's some cobwebs in the innermost recesses of my heart. Some things have gotten in the way, Lord. I, I, I'm ready for supper, just not now. If you'll let me finish these things first. It's interesting that you don't go but two chapters. You come to the end of that thing in Luke chapter number 14, and he said, Whoso loveth mother, father, sister, brother, husband, wife, uh, children, yea, his own life also cannot be my disciple. You don't go but a couple of more chapters. You know what he said? Uh, would you like to follow me? Lord, I'd love to follow you, but first... Would you like to follow me? Lord, I'd love to follow you, but first. Would you, in the same book, the same book of Luke, Dr. Luke wrote it. Lord, I'd love to follow you, but first. I'm not ready now. Oh, I'm ready to be a follower. I'm ready to let people know I'm a follower. Just don't inconvenience me. Not now. Yeah, now. If the Lord were to ring the dinner bell, would you say, I'm ready? Secondly, and I'm almost done. Have you let your loved ones know you're ready for the dinner bell to ring? So if the dinner bell rings and you get that stinking phone call, three o'clock in the morning, so-and-so fell, so-and-so passed, so-and-so got run over, so-and-so, do they know that, hey, you didn't have to come by the house to check him and me. They were ready for the dinner bell. Do your family know that? Do they know you're ready if that's what happens? Preacher, that's kind of morbid. Yeah, but ladies and gentlemen, if we don't live like we are dying, we are of all men most miserable. What's the point? Amen. I'm ready. If supper's ready, he's, re he's the one that's got it ready. I like to eat it when it's hot. I mean, I don't like it so hot that you put it in your mouth it burns holes in you. You know, you bite into a decent pizza and they got that cheese so hot that it sticks to your mouth and then you pull it off. Now the pizza's no good anymore. It tastes like blood. Because it doesn't rip the insides out of your mouth. That'll ruin a good meal in a heartbeat, man. Kind of like, man... This is bad, but I, but I do like, food has a, it's an enhanced flavor when it's hot. Now you may be different than me. I don't like cold soup. That's supposed to be something like rich people like. I guess that's why I don't like it. But, but soup to me says hot. You know, this is cold soup. We'll put it in the oven. Put it back in the pot. Put it in the microwave. For the Lord's sake. I don't want no cold soup. They call that jello.
But I learned this from a chef. Food heated to the proper temperature enhances the flavor of the food you're about to eat. It brings out the best in the food. I'm like, pretty good. But if you're late and the dinner's cold, the experience that the people have from eating the hot food will be entirely different from you that eats leftovers. After it's cold. Some people don't care for leftovers. At all. You just well throw them in the garbage can. But you know what I do know about leftovers? They taste almost as good as they did when you first got them, as long as you reheat them first. And it brings back the memories of the first time you sat down and had them. If the Lord calls for supper, He wants to serve it while it tastes the best. And us having to stop by and check in and check on stuff before we get there. It takes away from the enhancement of the flavors. And we miss the best that he prepared for us because we weren't ready when he whistled. I want to ask you a question. I'm going to close. If the Lord saw fit today, and you're saved, praise the Lord, glad you're saved. But I'm talking beyond just being saved. Ladies and gentlemen, we're getting older. We're going to experience more and more of the saints departing. We're not in control of the timeline. The Lord chooses when to whistle for His saints. The issue is not for you to determine which saints you're ready to see go. The issue is, are you ready to go? Or will you make an excuse? Lord, I'd like to, but first. Lord, I appreciate the opportunity, but first. Lord, I know, I promised you, <clears throat> I'd come to supper. I told you that, but between when I promised that and now, something more important than having supper with you has gotten in the way. Think about this and I'm done. What could be more important than having supper with the Savior? What if your place at the table is directly related to whether or not you're ready when He calls? Heads are bowed, eyes are closed. I am going to ask Miss Pat to come. Boys, y'all help her get up the stairs there. I'm going to pray in just a moment. If the Lord spoke to you, would you take the time to come? Are you ready? I'm ready, preacher. No, I mean, if He were to call you now. I'm ready, just not now. Let's take that out. I'm ready. If He rings the dinner bell today, are you ready? Don't worry about anybody else. Are you ready? Come on, young and old, teenagers, young people. Can you think about it? It's where we live. It's important. Come on. Our Father, bless this time of invitation. Help us as we consider these matters to realize you're in control of when you call us home for supper. And pray, God, that you might help us jog our memories, more importantly, clean out our hearts. Get us ready for that glorious day when we sit down to supper with you. Please bless this time we have in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. God spoke to you. You come. We won't tarry long. They're still coming. If you'd like to come, you come on. If you need help, we'll be glad to come pray with you. Otherwise, we'll leave you alone. God spoke to you. You come. Won't you come? Come on. Nobody's taking names. Nobody's going to bother you. Nobody's going to show up at your door and come knocking and Try to confirm your decision. This is between you and the Lord.
Why do we give an invitation? That's what he did. He gave an invitation. They said they'd come. That's what we're doing now. Giving you a chance. If you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, and when I say what I'm about to say, I don't mean a date and a time. I mean a time where you know you came to Him as a sinner and asked Him to save you from your sins and to keep you from going to hell. If that time is not there in your life, whatever the day or the hour it was or the time of the day, then you're what the Bible says, lost without hope and without God. Your eternity, you'll be in hell for a while and then in the lake of fire forever. But there's a way out. You know what he's saying to you today? Why don't you come now? And let's sit down and talk about it. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as wool. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as snow. You can be saved today. Your eternal destination be fixed. If you're like that, will you allow us to take a Bible? I have both men and women in here that can take a Bible in a very short period of time, lead you to Jesus Christ and show you how you can be saved. One more stanza. If no one comes, we'll close the invitation. One more stanza. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning being reminded of the fact that you're liable to call supper at any time. And while our souls are ready because we're washed in the blood of Jesus Christ and cleansed from all of our sin, there may be, may be some reckoning for us at the judgment seat because we've let some things creep in and we're ready. We're just not ready right now. I pray, God, that you'll help us to begin right now, this day, make a new and a fresh commitment to you, to rededicate, as they used to say, our lives to you, to recognize we're not in control of the expiration date, that one day we're going to spend eternity with you and let us not be ashamed of that moment. And pray, Lord, you'll bless these folks. Thank you so much for the amount of people that showed up yesterday and without difficulty, problems, quarrels, or anything else, get all the work that needed to be done, done. God, would you please be with all the numerous people that will be over there during the entire week that you'll protect them, watch over them, give them wisdom, help them to be able to put things where they need to be and get things done for your honor and for your glory. I pray, Lord, that you'll be with me and my wife as we go through these things that we need to go through. Give us wisdom and insight. Help us to know what we need to do. Help us to listen to the right things and ignore the wrong. I pray, Father, you'll bless these people in this church who've continued by sweat and by giving of their own finances and their own time. Lord, let them see the fruition of that. Let them cross into Canaan. Let them see you do a mighty work in this place because of their willingness to sacrifice. Would you please be with us as we go our separate ways this afternoon. Help us to enjoy the time of fellowship together and bring us back this evening at 445. We pray in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. All right, God bless you, and Lord willing, we'll see you at 4.45.